Dr. David M. Freed is the Chief Technology Officer at Coventer, where he is responsible for the company's strategic direction and implementation of its simulated 3D, a virtual fabrication 3D process modeling solution. He leads the execution of technology strategy for technology platforms, partnerships, and external relationships. His expertise touches upon several areas such as silicon and insulator, finfets, memory scaling, strain silicon, and process variability. Dr. Freed is a well-respected technologist in the semiconductor industry. He has 45 patents to his credit and had a notable 14-year career with IBM, where he was involved in successive process generation from 65 nanometer and lower. Dr. Uh, Freed has his master's and doctoral and degrees in electrical engineering from Cornell University. Okay, so uh, for anybody who follows the industry and reads the publications and you know reads the, uh, the conference proceedings, we're seeing a lot of really interesting things coming out of the semiconductor industry these days. Um, on a transistor level, uh, Intel has obviously published their FinFET technology at 22 nanometer and most of the industry has their head down focused on getting FinFETs into production right now. Uh, Intel also, in that same paper, they showed really interesting stuff about cell phone contact. Uh, it's a technology that's been used in DRAM for many years, but it's finally making it into logic. The memory developers, like Toshiba, are publishing some really crazy 3D integrated structures, like this uh, bit cost sensitive flash. And you're seeing, obviously, a lot of 3D integration with TSVs and chip stacking. So there's a ton of process and structural complexity out there that's enabling uh, the, the more advanced nodes and the future nodes. And all these, all these incredible technology investments, they're coming at the expense of incredible cost and complexity. Um, so the cost and complexity of these technologies is being driven primarily by these technology fundamentals, looking you know these, these new structures and these new technologies but also uh, the fab operations that make them possible. So most of these complex uh, designs and structures require multi-level patterning at each design level. We're looking, we're staring down the barrel of EUV, uh, extreme ultraviolet lithography, you know, $300 million per patterning tool, and the transition to 450 millimeter wafers is sort of right around the corner. Uh, all of these put together, operations and fundamentals, are driving the technology cost through the roof. So to, to put some numbers behind this, just building a new fab costs between five and ten billion U.S. dollars. Um, once you build the fab, uh, putting a new process online, facilitizing and developing a new process, is greater than two billion U.S. dollars. It is a tremendous amount money and all of this money gets spent before you can run a single revenue generating wafer. Okay, so it's, it's sunk cost before you ever start making money. Um, a lot of that money, a lot of that two billion dollars to put a new process online is spent in cycles of experimental learning. So lots of wafers in the fab, lots of development effort and you're running cycles and cycles of learning with lots of wafers and all of those wafers basically go in the garbage because they're not product. Um, a single cycle of learning with all the wafers and all the characterization, it costs on the order of $50 million. And it can take about three months to develop you know, a set of changes that get incorporated into a technology. So with that amount of money and that amount of time, the industry is learning that doing this with trial and error, just running more wafers and more wafers and more wafers, it's not acceptable anymore. Um, it takes too long and it costs too much. The, the time and the cost of trial is way too great. Uh, the problem is really when you hit those errors, if you have a, a, a process error, a drift, a misprocess, the penalty is too extreme. Uh, if an if a advanced foundry loses three months in its development cycle and they enter manufacturing three months behind one of their competitors, they will lose hundreds of millions of dollars of product revenue. And so the penalty for, for this type of trial and error is just way too extreme. And this is basically being seen across the industry right now. And the advanced foundries, the IDMs, the memory manufacturers, anybody who produces silicon right now is, is really driving towards more virtual solutions for development uh, to, to cut down on this $2 billion process cost. 
And so Simulator is a, a powerful 3D semiconductor modeling platform. It's really aimed at a virtual fabrication solution uh, so that we can develop technologies virtually instead of wasting wafers and time. So let me just explain a bit about what Simulator is. Um, the heart of Simulator 3D is our proprietary voxel modeling engine. And this is really quite different from a lot of other process modeling tools. Uh, a lot of sort of TCAD-based tools and process models, they use a boundary representation or a moving mesh technology. And those, uh, those techniques are great when you know the surfaces a priori. You know the structure beforehand. And you can express the surfaces as mathematical uh, formalisms. The objective here in virtual fabrication is to be predictive. Um, so if something goes wrong, if some structure has a defect, we want to be able to model it predictively and properly. And so we use this voxel technology uh, because it's more robust when the structures are not known beforehand. So um, you have a television. It has pixels in X and Y. A voxel is just the 3D version of a pixel. It's just three dimensions. And it has a uniform dimension in, in X, Y, and Z. So all of our models that we build are built up of these uniform resolution 3D voxels. Um, and a lot, of the, a lot of the IP behind Simulator 3D is how to make voxel modeling really, really fast. Um, so this voxel engine, it takes two different types of inputs. So the first is you know, the layout, or design data. And this could be real straight up design data. Uh, but some of our bigger customers, they use, uh, they take their OPC data or print simulated litho contours. Um, so this really gives sort of the XY uh, dimension to the 3D models. And the other input is from our process editor. And this is really a step-by-step -step behavioral description of the process flow, the depositions and etches and cleans and implants, um, lithography. So this is really the process description. And what happens is the modeling engine takes those two inputs and builds a step-by-step -step physical representation that is really the combination of that, that design and that process. And what you see running here on the right side of the screen is just a, an animation of one of the model builds for, uh, I have to look at that. It's a little bit bigger than an SRAM bit. It's a, uh, maybe actually it's a one bit of a thin fat SRAM. Um, it's got some interesting technology elements to it, but it's mainly just demonstrating that the, the output of Simulator 3D is a step-by-step -step predictive 3D physical model that combines this process and layout. So a couple things to sort of mention when we talk about virtual fabrication is it really has to be the juxtaposition of, of design and technology or design and process. And so the way simulator works really is the, the voxel modeling engine is sort of like our fab. And we install a process in the fab through this process editor, and then you can throw any design you want at it. And the process doesn't really know the design, and the design doesn't know the process. The fab combines design and process to make structure. And because of this, because they're separate inputs, this type of virtual fabrication platform is applicable to any process and any layout. So what I'm showing here happens to be a, a FinSet logic demonstration. <coughs> Pardon me. But this is really applicable to anything. So we have uh, you know, folks working in advanced memory structures, or uh, CMOS image sensors, or MEMS, or lots of different fundamental technologies that are all modelable in the, with the same virtual fabrication platform. OK. So uh, I guess I, I'll jump right into a couple examples uh, of how you might use this to do technology development. And uh, I'll try to keep my, uh, my memory intact and, and remember how I would have changed my graduate school experience if I had a virtual fabrication platform instead of just a couple boxes of wafers in the fab. If anybody has any questions, please just jump in and ask. OK. 
Okay, so uh, the first example, and this is sort of what I would consider bread and butter virtual fabrication, um, is uh, I'm, I'm going to use an example here. And it's an SOI-based FinFET process, but you can imagine this being any challenging etch here. Um, so in this picture here, I have the, the from the bottom up, the light blue is the buried oxide of an SOI wafer, and I've already patterned one PFET fin and two NFET fins. And what you see is a relatively complicated green metal stack over the top and a red polysilicon. And I've already gone through the, the hard mass patterning. So the gray on top is a nitride hard mass that's already been patterned. And so if you look at this, the, the gate stack etch, to etch this red polysilicon and the green metal gates selective to the fins is a really, really challenging etch process. It's got a lot of topography. It's got a lot of different materials. And so having to develop the, the stack etch for this is really difficult. Um, and so I use simulator. Uh, I use virtual fabrication to try to walk through the different components of this etch and understand what are the fundamental requirements of each of these, each step and each component of the etch step, the selectivity, the anisotropy to undercut the etch targeting for each step. So the first step of the etch is going to be a very vertical polysilicon etch. And it will be highly selective to a lot of materials, probably highly selective to metal, but um, because of the topography, you know, you'll probably eat through the metal at the top of the fan on the end cuts where the metal was thin, um, but, but leave some metal where the thick stack was on the feed cut. Subsequent steps are going to have to be much more isotropic. The so sidewall cleanup and an isotropic metal etch and then an isotropic high K etch. And so these are the, the steps of the stack etch. And, you know, you can iterate very, very quickly. Each iteration of this model is about two or three seconds of modeling. What I'm able to do is modify the parameters of each of those etches in my virtual fabrication environment until I achieve the desired objective. I know what structure I'm trying to etch, and I just have to modify the behavior of the etch component so I get what I want. What I notice here, what I can study, is a lot of the real complicated geometry that emerges this type of an etch. I, you can see there's some undercut where the metal gets undercut underneath the polysilicon, the green undercutting the red. And you also see some really interesting footing behavior where the metal films have a, a sort of strange 3D profile on a foot down at the base of the fin, and that can have some pretty serious impact on transistor behavior. Okay. Now, I've been through several generations of technology development in the industry, and if, if I had to develop that gate patterning procedure in the fab and do it repeatedly in a manufacturing environment, that would drive hundreds of wafers in the fab and several months of effort. Okay? In addition, tremendous analysis resources, like a lot of SEMs and TEMs and inline metrology. So it's incredibly expensive to use trial and error silicon engineering to do this type of complex etch development where I can use a virtual fabrication environment, I can develop my processes and develop my integrated flow virtually, and then be much more intelligent when I go into the fab with a couple of silicon, a couple of wafers, and actually be able to achieve the, the desired structural objective much more simply. Okay? So this is sort of what I would consider the bread and butter virtual fabrication experience, where you're able to develop process and design process virtually to make your pin fab time much more uh, efficient. All right, so when I started using uh, virtual fabrication to solve my technology problems, the pretty pictures were, were pretty exciting. To be able to make 3D pictures that were predictive of my process, and I could show where my process would go wrong and where it would fail and how it would fail. That was pretty useful. But I realized pretty quickly that I wanted to get beyond just making pretty pictures. And that these 3D models, because they were predictive and because they were high resolution, there was a lot of very critical data buried in these models. A lot of important dimensions, uh, physical structures and spaces and line widths 
that I wanted to be able to extract from these models quantitatively, not just make pretty pictures. And so over the course of the last few years, um, both when I was still at IBM and now at CoVenter, uh, we developed two key capabilities that really allow us to be much more analytical with these 3D models. And the first we call virtual metrology. And this is really the automation of measurements in these 3D models. And so uh, you can perform any structural measurement during the process, at any step, or at the end of the process. You can specify these measurements at any location in the layout. So uh, in a typical fab run, your measurements are done in the scribe lines on specific characterization structures, and you have to infer what's going on in the product. But in the virtual domain, you can measure anywhere you want, and so measurement directly on product layouts is much more effective. And with these capabilities, you can measure anything you can measure in a fab. You know, film thickness, step height, critical dimension. We can do a, a virtual AFM measurement over some topology. We can do a lot of measurements that you can't do in the fab, like uh, interface area. Uh, you know, if you want to measure the amount of area that a certain metal touches a certain silicon material, you can specify that and measure the interface area. So that's a measurement you can't even do in the fab. We can do virtually very easily. Uh, and then we've also developed this uh, batch execution engine. And this, uh, this, this enables us to do iterative runs where we specify a range of processes. Instead of just specifying a 20 nanometer etch, we would specify the etch might be somewhere between 15 and 25 nanometers, and the batch execution engine will build all of those models uh, deterministically, but for each of them extract all the virtual metrology data so you can quantitatively analyze your process and your structure. And so to kind of show these examples off, I made this cute little model of uh, sidewall image transfer. So um, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with sidewall image transfer process, or uh, some people call this spacer patterning. But basically, you, you would deposit some sacrificial films, um, pattern a sacrificial film, and typically we're patterning this at the resolution limit. And then we use a deposition and etch process to define spacers. You remove that sacrificial layer and you have these freestanding spacers that can then be used as a patterning mask. And so what you get out of this spacer patterning or sidewall image transfer is you're able to pattern features at twice the resolution limited pitch. Okay? So this is sort of a, we call this a frequency doubling technique for patterning. Um, an interesting feature of spacer patterning is that you get two different, what I call, pair types. Uh, there's a spacer-to-spacer -spacer interaction that defines what's called an outer pair. And then there's an inner pair that's really defined by the patterning of that original sacrificial layer. And typically what you really want is you want those pairs to have the same exact spacing so you have a nice even constant pitch. But this isn't as simple as old patterning techniques where uh, if you don't get what you want, you just go yell at your OPC guy or your, your litho team to improve the patterning. This type of patterning involves depositions and etches and cleans and litho and many different processes that all need to be co-optimized at the same time. So what I did here in this example is I put some measurement operations in my model between the outer and inner pair types. And then I varied some process parameters. And I chose to vary the mandrel lithography bias and that spacer thickness. So this is kind of you know taking two processes and saying, well, what if they varied around? And let's see what the resulting structure is, and let's analyze it quantitatively instead of just pretty pictures. Um, so very quickly, I'm able to make some pretty cool data here. Um, this plot is the fin-to-fin -fin space plotted versus the mandrel lithography bias, one of my process parameters. And each color on this plot is the different spacer thickness. So you can see I have two process variables, and I'm plotting the thin to thin space. So that inner pair type, all the curves kind of line up on, on, on one another down in the uh, lower right part of the chart. And what that 
that says is that there's no dependence on the spacer thickness. Uh, they all give the same thin to thin space. Now you see the curves kind of roll over here on the left side of the plot, and that's where our spacers are merging, and so we're, we're not getting individual fins. We're getting a process failure there, and the virtual metrology is capturing that. Now the outer pair type, interestingly enough, it has the exact opposite dependence on lithography bias, and the different spacer thicknesses are giving different thin to thin space. Okay? And where you really want to operate your process here is where these curves cross over and the inner space and the outer space is the same. And so very quickly, I run on a 42-way split or a 42-way experiment here and determined that only a couple points in here are really valuable to go run in silicon. And so I've dramatically reduced the amount of wafers I would need to run in the fab to center this process. And each data point here took about six seconds to run. And so over the course of a cup of coffee, I figured out my process centering for two key parameters here and a sensitivity analysis around those two parameters on this complex patterning scheme. Okay. So now, I, you know, this is an example of going, taking a virtual fabrication platform and going beyond just making pictures and documenting process, but being able to use it for process centering and a sensitivity analysis. Okay. Is everybody still there? Have I put everybody to sleep yet? All right, I'm just going to keep talking. If everybody's sleeping, we'll get another 20 minutes to nap here. Um, well, I want to show one other example. You know, that, that previous example I showed was relatively simple. It was a single type of patterning, and it was just lines and spaces. It was really simple. Um, so what I did is I, I took and I developed the rest of this process flow. So this is a, an SOI-based FinFET flow, as I said before. Has that side wall image transfer to define the fins. It's a gate first architecture. It's that stack we etched in the first example. And then it goes on and it, it does a silicon germanium epitaxial PFET source strain. So if I look at this picture where it's labeled after epi, you see those big fat purple regions in the middle. That's where I've grown silicon germanium on the PFET source strains. I and mean, then the last picture is, you know, this finishes up with a local interconnect style middle of line. So that's the device interconnect there. Um, now, I, I went and I, you know, sitting in a, alone in an office, I designed an SRAM cell. And so I tried to do this without thinking too much about the process and just designing a, a, an SRAM cell to see what would happen. And I designed an SRAM cell at, at 0.104 micron squared, which is a reasonably dense bit cell area for uh, 22 nanometer node technology. And I ran it through my model and what I see very quickly for this very specific design is there's a really tight space in the middle between these two PFETs. And I think if I looked at that quickly, that looks like a shorting risk to me that epitaxially those two parts are going to join and I'll have a short and I have a yield risk as a result. So what I wanted to do is take this virtual fabrication platform and try to analyze that shorting risk in the same way with, uh, with virtual metrology, measuring the PFET to PFET space there, and some process variations. And so I just chose a couple of processes here, this spacer thickness and my epitaxial thickness to try to measure uh, the shorting risk. Now, I chose those two parameters intentionally because basically that spacer thickness is very, very early in the flow. And the epitaxial growth is very, very late in the flow. And if your processes are right next to each other, it's kind of intuitive to understand how variation relates between one and the other. But when your processes that you're thinking about are very far apart in the flow, it's very difficult to understand how they relate to one another without this type of predictive 3D modeling platform. And so I chose two processes really far apart in the flow. Okay, so 
very quickly I'm able to, to look at that specific SRAM cell and the shorting risk in the center of the cell through this process variation. So what I'm plotting here is the PFET to PFET space in the center of the cell as a function of that sidewall image transfer space or thickness. And each of the curves here is a different thickness, target thickness of epitaxy. And so what I see here is I, I have a nominal 20 nanometer epi thickness. And it looks like a pretty robust space between the p -fets, about, you know, 25 nanometer space or so. And that's, that's pretty robust in advanced technology. And if I grow a little bit less epitaxy, I have a bigger space. And if I grow a little bit more epitaxy, I have a smaller space. So these top three curves sort of map out the process window of this technology. So I did a little experiment, and I just let it run longer and longer epi to see if these curves just went down into the ground. And I got this very odd kink in my data. I didn't really expect that, and I didn't understand that. So I started by saying, I wanted to get away from making pretty pictures, and I wanted to get the data. Well, now I've got all the data I want. I don't understand it. I need to get back to my pretty pictures. Uh, but it's important to realize that in this virtual fabrication technique, each of those data points is a fully built 3D model. And I'm able to immediately turn around, try to understand that data by going back to the physical, graphical representation of the model. Now, this is kind of an interesting little experiment here. At that nominal case where I had a, a thin spacer, 20 nanometer spacer, and I did a thin epi, 20 nanometer epi, you look at a cross-section between those PFETs, and you see a couple interesting things. So the, the red fins on the left and right, those are the end fets, and they're covered by this gray nitride, so they, they don't grow the epi. And you can still see their blue, dark blue cap oxide on top of them. While the PFETs have no cap oxide, the, the pink fins is from the boron doping, there's no cap oxide left, which means there's enough etch and clean process uh, budget to totally remove the cap before the epi happens. And so the cap is removed, the epi grows around all three sides of its fin conformally, and you have plenty of space between the fins. So then in case one, I made the, the space are much thicker. And so the result of that is that the fins are fatter. You see the fins in this second picture are fatter. I then grew 30 nanometer epi, a bunch more epi. And what you see is there's still enough wet etch and clean budget to, to remove those blue caps from the PFAS. So the epi is still going three and it's so thick that it's right almost against the shorting criteria. Okay, so these epis are almost shorting. And I think if I made the fins just a little bit fatter, they'd short. So in the next case, case two, I made my epi, or I made my spacer a little bit thicker, and you see the fins are even fatter. And what happens here is I ran out of etch and clean budget. So I've accidentally left a little bit of blue residual oxide on these PFET fins, and that has totally changed the epi morphology. Now the epi still grows up and over them eventually, but it's changed the F rate or the epi rate enough so that these don't short where I expected them to. And this is like a really subtle effect from the combination of a couple process variations that I never would have seen coming unless I had a predictive 3D model like this. So this is the type of, the type of integration and yield challenge that that space in development. And often you need thousands, if not millions of wafers in the fab to fill out the statistical distributions until this type of problem starts hitting you. And if you do it in the fab with thousands or millions of wafers and you figure out this type of uh, of, of mechanism, it's very, very expensive, and it's very difficult to change the process to late. But if you can discover this using virtual fabrication, you can adjust your nominal process to avoid this type of subtle, odd effect that arises as a result of a combination of different process variations. You know, so an interesting thing that a lot of people like to do is, is to look at papers, to look at papers from IEDM or other conferences, the LSI as an example, and say, wow, how did they build that? What is the technology that lets those structures get built? 
And so I, I took uh, uh, from a paper by Chris Oath at BLSI 2012 where they show those self-aligned contacts. I said, well, what on earth does the process look like to make self-aligned contacts? And I built this example thin set flow and I started varying around the layout. Well, I, I did an automatic variation study where I I just looked at what happens if the lithography overlay for the contact misses its target and it starts to flop over the gate. And lo and behold, if I specify my edge selectivities correctly and my process properly, I get a self-aligned contact process that looks remarkably similar to the cross-section here from VLSI 2012. So this is a really, a really simple way to be able to mock up processes and determine the process requirements based on publicly available information. Okay, you know, looking at a publication and saying, well, how, how on earth did they build that and be able to, to build that process and sort of reverse engineer uh, some publicly available information. I, I think it's, it's really clear that 22 nanometer technology and beyond requires this type of 3D process modeling and virtual fabrication. Um, we're just seeing process complexity dominate in logic, SRAM, DRAM, Flash, uh, and everything else. I mean, even uh, um, CMOS image sensors for cameras and things. The process technology is just getting amazing, amazingly complicated, and very, very expensive to develop. Simulator 3D. Uh, as a virtual fabrication platform, it's the most reliable and accurate, fast modeling platform in the industry. Really, it's because it's focused on the structural modeling. It's focused on the problem at hand, which is the process structural complexity. The basic process development using virtual fabrication, it saves time, money, and resources. And if I'm thinking about this from a grad school perspective, you don't have many wafers to use in the past, so you really want to use them intelligently. And so this type of a virtual approach for process planning and experiment planning can really improve your efficiency in, in, in developing. Um, one of the things I tried to show here with some of these examples is that Simulator 3D and any effective virtual fabrication platform really needs to go beyond just visualization. So these virtual metrology and batch execution capabilities really get to the quantitative analysis of, of predictive 3D modeling. You can do process centering conditions. You can do sensitivity analyses on your process. Uh, this type of predictive 3D engine is really the only way you can uh, evaluate the impacts of processes that are either far downstream or really separated in your process flow. You can use this to provide a, an early view into uh, what we call corners corners of the process window or sensitivities that are design technology related. Uh, as we start to expand our, our user base on simulator 3D, it's pretty interesting. We found a lot of interesting use models in all the different semiconductor user groups. So I think the benefits to technology developers, the, the IDM and the foundries, is quite obvious. Uh, those are guys developing the process flows and they need a virtual approach to make it more efficient. But we're working with more fabulous companies that really want to understand how their design is going to manifest in the foundry technology. So being able to do their foundry interface work in the physical domain with this virtual fabrication platform is quite valuable. Be able to evaluate their own designs and their own IP and make design for manufacturability decisions. Um, also with the equipment and process vendors, try to understand their particular process in the integrated context of a real technology. Um, so you know, an etch vendor really needs to know how, how their etch is going to fit into an overall integration where they only have the etch component. They don't, they don't have the rest of the fab. And so to be able to understand that and plan their etch to be optimized for a specific integration, it's really essential to have a virtual approach. So I think with that, I've, I've gone through my, my basic material here. And, Wondering if anybody had any questions. Just thank you for, for listening to me. Um, thank you, David. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, we have one question, uh, and it reads: Is it possible to have a tutorial webinar on Simulator 3D? Uh, 
or do we have any online tutorials as to how to use the software? Um, online tutorials. So, I mean, there we have a uh, we have a bunch of tutorials and and um, and example cases that we typically ship with our software. So, uh, if you have access to the software, a lot of that's online and uh, and included. And obviously, if we you know um, when we collaborate with our customers, we work very closely on some modeling methodologies and best best practices for modeling. So uh, there's a lot of different ways to uh, a lot of different ways to achieve the same modeling objective, and we try to collaborate with a lot of our a lot of our customers to, to make sure they're using the most predictive and best practices for modeling. Uh, but a lot of those tutorials and, and, and help and instructions come with the software. Uh, we have another question. How much does it cost to get an academic license? Uh, yeah, so I think um, uh, specifically with regard to this, uh, your facility, I think Gary Reardon is our uh, uh, account manager. I know he was the one who uh, connected to set up this webinar. So if we're interested in, in academic licensing or uh, putting together some type of a collaboration. I think Gary Reardon is the, the proper contact point at Coventry. I can give his information. If, I, I'm not sure if Gary's on the line. Is Gary on the call? Uh, no, he's not. He's not? Okay, so I can provide Gary's information if you want to pursue that after the call. Any further questions? Um, okay, I think uh, that's all for today. Thank you, David, for a very nice presentation. And uh, thank you, audience, for uh, listening into this webinar. For more uh, webinars on Coventer and uh, uh, um, uh, other webinars, please log into our website uh, to, to, be, to stay up to date. Uh, just before we close, we just got a last question. Uh, David, could you take that? Yeah. I think I just saw it on the chat window. Can it do non-standard processes like liftoff? Yeah, absolutely. So liftoff is very easy. Um, and you know, I think most of the fun, <laughs> most of the fun I have in simulator is the really non-standard stuff. So you know, real simple depositions and etches are that's that's sort of child play. And it's more fun when you get to uh, liftoff and wafer bonding. Uh, implants and, and interface growths, but I think, uh, you know, while I'm on, let me see, what do I have to do for sharing? Let me just share my whole desktop here for a second. Uh, you know, let's see if you can see this. Ouch. I might break your web content here. Um, can you see, I'm showing a 3D non-volatile memory structure. Do you see this? Yes, yes. Okay, so I mean, this is uh, this is a pretty complex process, and it's got some uh, undercut etches in the in the bottom for the pipe. It's got a very deep uh, and, and and somewhat isotropic slit etch. It's got some CMP with uh, a little bit of dishing and some uh, some over etch, so you see some dimpling in these in the top of these trench holes, and so. Um, we can do a lot of pretty crazy non-standard processes. Wow, it's really slow on the web conference, though. Um, and so uh, I think most of the fun <laughs> and most of the usefulness is that a lot of these processes are non-standard, and the complexities of those processes are absolutely essential for a virtual approach to technology development. And I mean, as far as the venture is concerned, we really pride ourselves on our ability to model any process out there in the fab. Um, we also have, let's see if I have it open. Um, we have some pretty neat epitaxy models. And these are really essential for some of the FinTech stuff that's going on in the industry right now. Um, wow, I hope this isn't too slow on the web conference. But you see, we have the capability to specify plane dependent epitaxy. And you know, epitaxy typically, both in germanium at least, 
limits itself on this 110 plane and so produces these uh, interesting facet shapes. And so we now have capability to do uh, you know, faceted epi growth, plane dependent epi growth. So really this is some of the most complex processes out there in the fabs these days and to have predictive virtual models for these processes is really essential. Um, I guess in this, uh, in this study I was looking at a couple of different plane rates and how it affected the actual epi. You can see this one's going much faster because of the higher 110 rate. And then here I have some overgrowth. So you can see it start to grow over on the nitride side. So really interesting behaviors that we're able to model with these different um, different process models. So yeah, the, the, the answer is definitely yes, we can handle the, uh, the advanced stuff. And that's, that's, really, uh, uh, that's really the fun of you. And uh, yes, Siddharth, you're, you are correct. That is uh, actually, I think the, the paper, I was using a paper to model that 3D NVRAM structure. I think it, it is a bit cost sensitive as in the BIC, but I think it's Toshiba's uh, paper that I was using. Um, non cmos stuff like oxidation of tungsten or tantalum, absolutely. Uh, we have RAM usage. Uh, all sorts of weird non-CMOS processes, absolutely. We really pride ourselves that we use, uh, we, we base a lot of the processing on what we call process primitives. Um, David? So they, yes. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but if you could read the question to the audience, oh, okay. everybody would benefit. Yeah, thank you. Okay, or sure. I could read it out for you. Oh, I'll read it. So uh, the first question is, can it do non-standard processes like liftoff? And so that's what got me started. And then he says, it looks like Samsung's BIC, and it's actually Toshiba's BIC that I was modeling that off of. Um, then he writes, how about non-CMOS stuff like oxidation of tungsten or tantalum or titanium? I use them in RAM. We need to input what kind of parameters to define weird non-CMOS processes like this. Um, so oxidation, oxidation is really just an interface growth for us. So typically we have, uh, we, we use interface growth as a primitive for any type of oxidation. Anytime you have uh, any material exposed to air in our model, or you know, exposed, then we can form, you know, tie oxide or tungsten oxide or whatever, whatever is the byproduct of that reaction. To us, that's an interface growth. And materials in this type of virtual fabrication platform are user defined. So if you want to put barium strontium titanate in a virtual fabrication platform, you better be able to because it has to be completely material flexible. The user needs to be able to do that so they can develop whatever process. Um, at the beginning of my presentation, one of the things I said is virtual fabrication can't just be for one technology. It has to be applicable to any process and any layout. And so our RAM is a great example where there's a bunch of new materials, the process is kind of different, non-CMOS, and the layout is specifically for that memory structure. A virtual fabrication platform has to be flexible enough to do all of that. And that and simulator 3D is really, because of our different input streams, where I have layout and process coming in separately, it works for any layout, any process, any set of materials. Great question, though. So. Ah, so it's cool, is there a way I could download a demo version? I work with RAM and trial and error in the clean room takes forever. Okay. Again, what I'm going to do is uh, at the end of this call, I'll, I'll uh, provide Gary Reardon's contact information. He's definitely the, uh, the right contact for figuring out uh, uh, demos or uh, collaborative engagements, and he's going to work with. But I think you really put your finger on the problem here. Trial and error in the clean room takes forever. So that's a problem in grad school, it's a problem in research, it's a problem in development, and it's a problem in advanced node manufacturing. Figuring out these problems in the fab is too expensive and it takes too long. Everyone is going towards a virtual environment and that's, that's what virtual fabrication is all about. All right, I got an email address. So I'll provide this. Uh, um, 
We have. Uh, do we have an attendee list somewhere that we can uh, that we can distribute information to? Uh, yeah, I'll 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 be sending you the list, and you could uh, send out the information. Okay, terrific. Thank you, David, uh, uh, and uh, thank you all for attending the webinar. Um, have a nice day. Thank Bye -bye. you so much.